Welcome to episode seven of the Robot Report podcast, which brings conversations with robotics innovators straight to you. My name is Steve Crow, editor of the Robot Report, joined as always by senior editor Eugene Dimitri. Gino, how's your week going, sir? It's good. It's busy. There's a lot of news. Um, and, you know, we're going to get into some of that in a moment. But uh, as always, we're doing the best we can. Any hankerings for, for White Castle after your uh, recent interview? You know, there are no White Castles around here. Otherwise, I would definitely uh, <laughs> be hungry for a converter. New episodes of the Robot Report podcast drop every Wednesday. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Please subscribe today and leave us a review. I'm not a I'm not a, a fast food guy myself. I ate it so much as a kid. My uh, my mom actually worked at a McDonald's when I was much younger. But, uh, <laughs> kind of turned me off. <laughs> I don't think I've had fast food in like 15 years. Yeah, I'm actually pretty spoiled. We have a lot of great pubs and, uh, and great burger joints in, in the Boston metro area. So um, I don't eat fast food except when I'm on the road. And I try to avoid that. But at the same time, uh, the opportunity to see... Uh, and, and taste food prepared by robots is certainly something that I think is very interesting. So we're, we're, we're talking a lot about uh, fast food here. Gene had a great conversation uh, with Buck Jordan, the co-founder and CEO of Miso Robotics. Uh, Miso just yesterday came out and announced a pilot with White Castle. So we'll, we'll play that interview in a little bit. But uh, up first, Gene, is our, our conversation with Hello Robot, which also just yesterday came out of stealth mode with its stretch mobile manipulator. Stretch has been in development for, I think, three plus years, and the first edition of the mobile manipulator is designed for academic and corporate researchers. Uh, but Gene, you know, based on our discussion and, and the article that we wrote up on the Robot Report, Aaron and Charlie, uh, the co-founders of, uh, of Hello Robot, have much more lofty long-term goals of, of getting mobile manipulation into the home. Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of experimentation on mobile manipulators, but uh, relatively few have gotten anywhere near market. And, you know, uh, Aaron and Charlie said, oh, some of our first interest was to try to help the disabled or the elderly in the home. Uh, I know that a lot of nursing homes, one of the most common requests they get for aides or orderlies is to pick up the remote, which they've dropped. And it seems like a simple thing for those of us who might be younger or healthier, but even something small like that can make a tremendous difference in people's quality of life. And, uh, you know, Aaron Ensinger has got experience from Mecha Robotics, Redwood Robotics, and Google. So, you know, I think these guys have some really strong technical chops. Yeah. So Aaron, you know, for folks who might not be aware, Aaron Edzinger sold both those companies, Mecha Robotics and Redwood, to Google in 2013. Charlie Kemp is a professor at Georgia Tech. He actually founded that university's healthcare robotics lab in, in 2007 and has done tremendous work throughout his career on assistive robotics. Uh, his lab was actually one of the 11 PR2 beta sites way back in the day. So, you know, Stretch is pretty cool. I mean, it's it's unlike, it's not like any mobile manipulator that I've seen to date. And, you know, one of the main differences is how lightweight it is. It's about 50 pounds. You know, Aaron, I think it's Aaron, talks about in, in the interview about how he can put it into his Prius and, and sort of bring it from one location to another quite easily. Now, when you compare that to like the PR2 or maybe Fetch's mobile manipulator, which is a great robot. It's just, that's such a difference right there. You know, it can be teleoperated. It can be, you know, it can function autonomously. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see where this all goes. Yeah, and I'm in, in, excited about the fact that, you know, by creating a, a developer platform that is portable and affordable and uh, extensible potentially with, you know, this uh, design that there's really we need to move the ball forward because I've seen a lot of mobile manipulator projects where, yeah, they take a mobile base, they stick a cobot arm on it, but it's too heavy to be practical or too uh, energy uh, demanding to be practical. And so really getting both the telescoping reach with uh, a more affordable and frankly smaller form factor, uh, it really does open up a lot of possibilities. So here's our conversation with Aaron Edzinger and Charlie Kemp, the co-founders of Hello Robot. We discussed the design of Stretch, how Stretch is different from other mobile manipulators on the market. Why This is really interesting, why Aaron and Charlie decided to self-fund the company. Charlie also shares a great story about how he teleoperated Stretch to take care of his family's cat while he was on, <laughs> while he was on vacation. So uh, enjoy the conversation. 
Aaron, Charlie, thank you guys for, for making the time to join us today. I'm sure things have been hectic. Oh, excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jim. Uh, more importantly, though, I think you guys know this. You're the first duo to ever be on the Robot Report <laughs> podcast. <laughs> we've been, that feels we've, good. You know, we've been doing this for so long now. It's been like seven weeks that we've been doing this. So, you know, I'm sure that's a, a great honor for both of you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you came out with the, the Stretch Research Edition. I think it's been shipping since May of this year. Uh, Aaron, why don't you just tell us about Stretch? What's it all about? Sure. Well, it's a mobile manipulator, of course. Uh, so it's a wheeled robot with a uh, arm. And, uh, you know, I think the, you know, the thing that's remarkable about Stretch is it's actually uh, very uh, portable, compact, deployable. It's very kind of ingenious design. And, um, you know, really it was designed with the intent of ultimately being used in the home or the workplace. And, you know, when Charlie and I started talking about, uh, you know, doing a mobile manipulator with Hello Robot. Uh, we were both pretty clear about um, that the state of the field, what was out there wasn't sufficient, really wasn't credible as, you know, long-term these robots being in our homes or our workplace because they're too, too large, too complicated, too expensive. So what Stretch is, it's a mobile manipulator, but it's really, it's, it's a different type of robot in a sense in that it really can be um, portable, can be used in a, in a, in a Home type setting. Um, you know, one thing that I, I love about it in particular is I can throw it in the back of my Prius and I drive it around and take it down to the office, do some work, work from home. Um, so stretch, stretch is really a different type of type of robot. Um, and we're pretty excited about kind of what the implications of the design are. This is something that originated uh, out of your Georgia Tech lab, right? The design? Yeah, that, that's right. I've uh, had the ideas and basic notions. We created a prototype robot. Uh, we created a, a video demonstrating some of those capabilities and then kind of actually went out and had the good fortune of showing that video to Aaron and that has led to this exciting adventure. <laughs> Charlie, mobile manipulation has been a long time in coming. What about stretch is really going to advance that? I, you know, Stretch is, it's almost tough to talk about because it's different in so many ways. Uh, you know, for me, in terms of the things that excite me a lot, uh, it just, it solves all these pain points I was experiencing in my lab. My lab, I uh, see, I found it in 2007 and we focused on mobile manipulation since then. We've done work in real homes, primarily in the area of healthcare, providing assistance to people with disabilities. And, you know, in the end, all the different robots we worked with, we'd show these great possibilities of how they might really make a difference in people's lives. But there'd always be this but, you know, except, you know, these right. qualifications that would just, in terms of realism, could we actually make it happen? No, because it's too expensive or it's too big or it's too heavy or it's not safe enough. And I'm, I'm so excited about this because I feel like we're now finally, Stretch puts us on the path to something that can actually deliver on these promises. So what's the short term? I know the long term outlook is to to have stretch help people out and maybe in their homes or some other mm -hmm. environments. Uh, Aaron, just talk about the research edition and, and how you envision, whether it's a university or a corporate lab, what are some things you envision stretch doing? Are, are you guys just looking to sort of start off by democratizing mobile mm -hmm. manipulation research? I think that's one way to look at it. I mean, you know, at one level, it's it's a development platform, right? And I think it's a pretty great development platform, uh, particularly for people who aren't, uh, you know, haven't been in mobile manipulation because, you know, just the accessibility to these robots has been pretty sparse with, um, you know, uh, like a PR2, which would be, was a great robot uh, at, its, at its time and was uh, $400,000. Uh, so, you know. <laughs> nice <laughs> house. <laughs> uh, and, you know, Stretch is, it, you know, it's, it's very different than a PR2, but it has a lot of similarities in terms of capabilities and the intent and sort of an open source ethos and kind of a Roth stack and all that. But Stretch is, is uh, 17950 right? And, that really changes who can enter the game. And so, you know, one thing we're really excited about is that, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we will see entrance into mobile manipulation um, and people that are coming from not even robotics backgrounds, right? These could be groups that are um, 
more uh, kind of human studies, looking at human factors, looking at aging in place, lots of applications for mobile manipulation that weren't really practical to explore before because of the barrier with just the, 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 the robot itself. Um, so, so Stretch is, it's targeted towards researchers, research labs. Um, you know, already we've seen interesting pull from the corporate side. You know, our background, our experience is selling into academic research labs around, around the world. Um, and we're seeing a lot of great traction with that already. But, um, you know, we're expecting the unexpected. We've already seen, you know, we have one, one customer that is a kind of real- feel, customer. feel free to drop some names, customer names, you know, just, just feel free. <laughs> yeah, how would they think about that? <laughs> Throw them out, you yeah. know. Just yeah. Be, yeah, appreciate that. Uh, um, well, you know, and we are being fairly careful about sharing customer information, you know, we respect their privacy. But, but all to say, you know, while Stretch is designed for a research market, we're expecting to see a lot of interesting inbound opportunities that may not fit that mold. Related to that, by the way, I, is that we were surprised. We had definitely been always just thinking academic market, and yet the first two robots we sold ended up going to a venture-backed startup that had uh, heard about us and was excited about the possibilities, which has worked out great. Well, it seems like they're doing really exciting things, although... Uh, that's more closed and we're less able to talk about it. Sure. Well, Can I just follow up about the price? Because I think that's, it is quite fascinating to me. I mean, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned another mobile, the PR2, which back in the yeah. day was quite expensive. <laughs> yeah. uh, I know the fetch robot, it's a great robot. It's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. you, you know, Aaron, going back to your mecha robotics days, you know, mm -hmm. the M1, that was, that was a ton of money yep. too. Wasn't that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, Great robot, though. Great robot. Oh no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, but that was like three hundred and fifty grand a pop, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. what? So, what has transpired? You know, you, you sold that to Google in twenty thirteen. Mm -hmm. But what has transpired, or what were you and Charlie able to do to so significantly reduce the price? Yeah, it's really, really interesting question, and it, it was a, I guess the answer has different dimensions to it, right? I mean, one is just the progression of technology in general, right? The, the amount that you can get for a dollar, amount of motor that you can buy for a dollar now, um, that's just gotten better. Uh, so some things are just a matter of, of time. Um, uh, things like, you know, we can get this in, Intel Real, Real Sense camera, which is a, a nice 3D depth camera for a few hundred dollars. Um, so some of that stuff just kind of uh, wasn't possible when, it, when Mecca did the M1. Our PR2 did, uh, Willow Garage did the PR2. Uh, but, you know, I think that the, the thing that's particular about Stretch is, well, first off, we started viewing it as a consumer product. And, you know, through the evolution of the company and, and different iterations of the technology and looking at the market, we decided to start on the research side. But the DNA and heritage of Stretch was really from a consumer mindset. And what that means is some of the really kind of initial architectural decisions um, were thinking about extremely low cost at first. And uh, those decisions have carried through. And, you know, while 17,950 is, is a really good price in the research market, it's, it's probably far too expensive <laughs> in, in the consumer space. Um, so, so really, you know, there are a lot of uh, downstream benefits from this clever design that Stretch has. Um, you know, one example in terms of cost is it's, it's very lightweight. It's about 53 pounds. Um, most of that weight is down in the base, so it's not top heavy. Uh, and what that means is then you need smaller motors to support the mass of the robot against gravity. And often, you know, like with, with a Mecha, you know, we'd spend about three to four or five thousand dollars on a shoulder joint to support that arm up against gravity, because that arm would then weigh, you know, ten kilos. So there's there's this nonlinear scaling that happens when you get to lighter weight, um, and so that's kind of one one of the the benefits of Stretch's design and the architecture is we can get away with uh, cheaper motors put in the right place that aren't spending all of their energy fighting uh, gravity. Yeah, so I mean, the the design from the beginning in my lab that was driven by this notion, or well, there were a lot of factors we were considering, but one of the biggest ones that was influential when I was designing this was 
to make it so that it would be low cost. And the notion was to basically minimize the actuator requirements. And so in this design, there's only one actuator that actually has to work against gravity directly, and that's the lift motor. And yet it has this arm assembly, which is lightweight and carbon fiber. And so that, I think that ended up really paying off that philosophy of how can we maximize the capabilities while minimizing the actuator requirements. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of stuff that's happened after that at the company in Hello Robot that was essential. And I totally agree with Aaron, having this consumer mindset from the start end up really paying off. But it's also the case that the fundamental design supported this, this opportunity and this ability to, to make it a well-priced platform. So speaking of the design and, and making it both functional and economical, how modular is it? Uh, can you swap in uh, new cameras, new grippers, new yep. sensors or motors? What, what's the nature <laughs> of that? Yeah, well, well you know, the core um, robot itself is not modular. The, the essential arm base structure, that's highly integrated, which is to its benefit. Um, because we can get these cost savings and kind of really kind of um, maximize the capability for the cost. At the same time, then we, we knew for the research market, uh, researchers are going to want to add devices, you know, tablets, cameras, sensors, Arduinos, new grippers, you know, and so we were very aware of, of that need. And so there are multiple mounting points, multiple USB points. Um, there is an Arduino expansion in the wrist. And you know, one choice that we made is that at the, um, at the end of the arm, instead of having a, a three degree of freedom wrist um, that a lot of dexterous robots would have, we have a single, uh, basically it's a pan joint that allows a tool to stow back within the footprint of the robot and unstow when it's doing manipulation. Um, and that, but that joint is based on the Dynamixel, uh, you know, Robotis Servo, which then makes it very easy for a user to extend that joint so they can plug in other servos onto the end of the wrist. And, you know, we've already, we've done a three to off wrist with a gripper using those servos. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility, uh, but we knew for the kind of core product that we wanted to have the minimal arrangement that lets people kind of do useful work. And then we'll see what customers want to do with, with it from there in terms of hardware extensibility. I know that there's a teleoperation feature. Uh, what's the connectivity for that? There, there are sort of two, right now we have two ways of teleoperating stretch. Uh, one thing that's a lot of fun is that when you get stretch, it's just, it comes in a cardboard box, you open it up, you unpack it, you turn it on, you grab an Xbox style controller and you should be moving it around. And something that's been really fun for us is we've heard back from a number of customers where they've been able to just immediately drive it around and pick up an object. And I've, I've never known of a mobile manipulator like that where you can just with a simple controller actually get it to do something interesting in the real world. Uh, so that's just local connectivity through, uh, it's a, truly an Xbox style controller that you can get on Amazon and it's a dongle that plugs into the robot and you have the controller and you move it around while you see it. We also recently released code on GitHub for a web-based interface that uses WebRTC. Uh, you can, we, we have used uh, earlier versions of that code to do interesting teleoperation tasks. I actually took care of my cat while I was in rural <laughs> Tennessee. <laughs> that was a lot of fun with an earlier version of Stretch. Um, that, you know, it's, that code, it's really, it's all Apache 2.0. It's open source, which is the philosophy of our company. We have uh, everything is open source to really empower the customers to do what they want to do. But um, it's there and it's uh, fun to use. What, so what did you do? Tell us about the cat. What, what did you have to do to, <laughs> you say took care of the cat. Like, did you, you know, some people uh, walk their cats on a leash, you know, maybe. Yeah, no, maybe. we didn't do that. <laughs> oh, okay. What did you do? What did you do for your cat? So I would each day, so I was in rural Tennessee. So what I would do is I take my laptop, I tether to my phone my mobile phone and I'd go and take control of the robot. I would then go and get food, a can of food that I had placed on, can, I'd place cans of food on the counter. I'd grab one, get the lid off of it, dump it into the bowl on the ground. Then I'd go move it to a trash can and throw it away. 
Uh, after that, I would get water. I'd take a cup. I had an empty cup that was sitting on the countertop. I'd grab it, and then I'd fill it with water in the refrigerator, and then I'd pour that in a bowl, down a water bowl. Uh, and then I would inspect the kitty litter, and I actually put a lot of effort into designing this special tool for getting <laughs> the mess out of the kid litter. And the funny thing is I never had to use it. You know, I would go and I would inspect it and there'd be nothing there. So I, I never got to test that out remotely but, uh, for multiple days on end. It, it worked. I even took the bowls and I, I, the dirty bowls with the food, I would put them into the sink. Uh, the thing that was really magical was coming back and to walk in the kitchen. It's like, Oh my gosh, that was real. You know, all this stuff has actually changed. I was really right. taking care of our right. cat. It was a bizarre experience, but, but very fun. I mean, is that, a, I see a market opportunity for stretch here. I mean, you talked about, <laughs> you talk about researchers and in, in, in university labs and one day for, for people. I mean, the pet sitter market is booming. I, I you know, it's interesting. We, we talked about that, you know, when we first started out, we really were thinking of being more of a, a vertical where we would target a specific application and, and pet care was something that stood out. So I, I do think in the long term, there probably is something there. We've talked a lot about teleoperation, but there is a lot of autonomous features that Stretch is, is, is able to perform as well. That's right. We've, we've, yeah, in our development process, we had this notion that first First of all, it's very iterative. We went through many iterations of the robot. We we're always testing it in real environments with real tasks to make sure we were kind of making the right decisions and had them grounded. And we want to start with local teleop where you're teleoperating and you can see it, then move to remote teleoperation and then move to autonomy. And you know, the cat that taking care of my cat, that was an example of a remote teleoperation example. When we got to autonomy, that ended up being a bit of a challenge because we, we found that Previously, we had primarily relied on just regular cameras, but we really need to do what we wanted to do. We needed to move to a 3D camera, and that's when we moved to RealSense, and we ended up with a pan and tilt head. Uh, but it's, it really opens up a lot. So once we had that, you know, we were able, and we, we have these demos that ship with the robot. It's all open source code. It's all written in Python to make it easier to use. And then demos sort of give examples of ways in which you can use stretch. So there's an object grasping demo that will grasp an, an object off of a flat surface. There's a demo for wiping down a surface. There's a demo that writes hello on a whiteboard with a special marker tool. There's a demo for mapping and navigating autonomously. A demo for handing over an object that uses deep learning models to perceive you and decide where to hand it over. Uh, in fact, just yesterday we were talking to a customer and uh, they liked the demos and they were surprised because they actually worked. They're like, I, you know, demos aren't supposed to work on a robot. <laughs> so <laughs> as we're really happy to hear that. Um, and so we're, we've given these examples. They kind of give a sense for ways you can use Stretch. There are a lot of capabilities people could build on. But of course, we're, we're excited for people to take things to the next level and really see what, what people come up with. I know we've been talking about uh, different uh, things that you can do or swapping it out. Tell us a little bit about the, the, the gripper that you developed. So the, the gripper, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a compliant gripper, which um, just means, you know, it, it, it's a little bit more flexible. It's also can conform around objects. So it's really good at doing both a power grasp and a, and a pincher grasp. Uh, the thing that's unique about it is it, instead of having a linkage as a, usually a gripper might, it's really these spring flexures that have a little rubber suction cup elements on the end. And, uh, you know, I've worked on, you know, probably half a dozen different hands and grippers over the years, designed them. Um, this is by far the most capable and the most simple one I've ever worked on. So it's really, really kind of, um, you know, I'm still uh, struck by how well it works and how easy it is to, you know, produce, manufacture, maintain, uh, it's robust. Um, so it really is an elegant design. Uh, it goes back to the work that came out of Charlie's lab. Um, and, you know, it's not great for everything. If you want to do sort of dexterous manipulation, in-hand manipulation, it's not going to do that. But as sort of your, your kind of primary tool in your tool belt of manipulation, I think it, it's pretty, pretty uh, remarkable. Um, and maybe, Charlie, you can say a little bit more about how you, how you thought about it, came up with it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, would you like to hear some of the story? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, 
Uh, it's been a lot of great research on grippers. And I think one of my frustrations, and I'm sure frustrations in the robotics community in general, is that it's just hard to know how well you're doing because evaluation is so hard. There's so many different objects out there in the world and so many different circumstances. You know, How are you actually going to test and be confident you have something that works? And so I had this notion that, well, you know, uh, for people with disabilities, there are these grabber tools and you can use these grabber tools to grab objects off of the ground. There are a lot of them. They're used widely. People with disabilities really appreciate them. Uh, so I was like, hmm. And I looked on Amazon and it's like, oh, wow, I can get the top 10 rated grabber tools for, you know, just a couple hundred dollars. So I bought them. Uh, they had thousands of reviews. So I actually had a sense from instead of having to run this incredibly difficult user study, I had all this information and reviews from people who had actually used it in real homes with real objects. Um, and then basically I took all those and all the members of my lab, I threw a whole bunch of objects on the table and we all just kind of test them out and see what, uh, to see which one we liked best. The one we ended up with, <laughs> I really didn't think, I thought it was kind of weird looking. I was like, this one's not going to be the best. It doesn't look like a gripper I've ever messed with, but, but it had such a high review and people loved it uh, on Amazon. So I was like, okay, well, we're going to try it out. And it just blew away the others. Uh, so that was the inspiration. And we, we developed a, an actual robotic gripper and kind of roboticized that, that grabber tool. Uh, and then Hello Robot's just taken it to a whole nother level uh, and really pleased with how it's turned out. Because it's also nice, it's safe. Like when it's around me, I, I should say, I do, it feels safer than other grippers I've worked with. You know, I just don't mind being around it. Before, you, when you were showing me some demos, you, you showed me, and you guys have a bunch of videos on, on your website about the different types of objects that Stretch is, is picking up. Can, can you tell us, you know, are you training Stretch on these objects at all? Um, is it just the, the design of the gripper makes it so adept at picking things up? This is one of these classic things where you can move the intelligence into the hardware and, uh, you know, the, the mechanics of the gripper itself are really well suited to, you know, objects that are in human environments. And, and this is why on the Amazon reviews, it had the highest ratings, right? Because it actually works. And, um, and so primarily it, it's the mechanics of it. It's, it's the, the sort of spring loaded nature of the, the fingertip and the friction on the fingertip uh, surface, um, the conformability of it, all these things kind of make it so that you can kind of just get it near an object and hit close and it works. Um, and then of course that greatly simplifies the autonomous grasping side of it because uh, now what you need to do is kind of get approximately close in a, in the right orientation and, uh, and uh, you know, just say close and it'll close up around it. Uh, so, you know, I think across the robot, I feel like we've, we've, been playing that this game where you can move some of these technically hard problems into the hardware and solve them in a very elegant way, which in return then simplifies the autonomy and the, and the computational side of it. I know you and Charlie have known each other for <laughs> quite some time. I think, you know, Gene and I are from the Boston area. You guys have spent <laughs> many, many, uh, much of the time up here, up at, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, up at MIT, I think you both studied uh, with Rod Brooks. Yep. Maybe Charlie, can you, could you just tell us, you know, you, you were at Georgia Tech, Aaron, you were at Google. Just how did you guys get together and, and decide, you know what, yeah, I think we should pursue this thing called Hello Robots. How did you guys come together on this? Yeah, Aaron, Aaron and I had collaborated back back in graduate school. I, actually, I was in my, when we really took off and our collaboration took off was I was in my postdoc with Rod, uh, Rod Brooks, and Aaron was finishing his dissertation. And yeah, that was one of the most, satisfying collaborations I've ever had and one of the most productive periods I've ever had. I always look back fondly on that and you know, we had we had some success. We, for example, got a best paper at Humanoids, the conference, and I was just really pleased with it. Um, helped me get my job at Georgia Tech, frankly. So, you know, of course had that going. And then over the years, my lab has had, and, and I have had lots of collaborations with Aaron and, uh, even Aaron's companies. Like I think my lab had the first Mecco arms that were made and we loved them. 
and we were part of a DARPA grant together, which went really well. So, you know, there's this history and I don't, you know, I've been trying to pay more attention to it, right? It's like, why does this work? Because things, sometimes you just, you work with someone and it just works really well. And this is one of those examples. So when I had this video and I was going around the Bay Area showing it to, to people who I thought might have good feedback, Aaron was very high, you know, pretty much at the top of that list. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it to Aaron <laughs> after that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I can add, you know, Charlie came through in 20, I guess, 2017, um, a little over three years ago, uh, saying, hey, I've got this robot in my lab. It's sort of a secret project. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of thinking about wanting to start a company. And so he showed me the video and it was, uh, he called it Proto One, but it was a very early version of what you would recognize as Stretch today. And, um, uh, you know, I, I had, was at Google uh, as director of robotics there and starting to look for my next, my next, uh, next move, my next uh, com company. And I knew I wanted to get back to the startup world where, where I'm happiest. And, uh, and I also knew that, we, that in kind of robots for the home, something new had to happen, right, to get us out of the spot we we're in with these large, expensive, complex robots. Uh, so as soon as, as I saw Charlie's video, it just all kind of lined up and clicked. You know, here's a collaborator I, I love working with, respect, great, interesting technology, timing is right for us personally. And, um, you know, I think, I think very quickly, we started just making plans about, okay, well, how are we, how are we gonna do this? And, you know, originally, um, a big concern we had is, well, Charlie's in Atlanta. <laughs> he has a life there and a family there. And I'm in California and same. I've got a life and a family here. Um, how do we, how do we do a startup <laughs> building a compl complicated kind of mechatronic hardware product remotely? And um, turns out that actually wasn't an issue at all. And, and I think it goes to the, <laughs> the, this sort of long collaboration we've had over almost 20 years now. Uh, it makes it very easy to collaborate remotely because you, you know, we come from the same uh, mold of robotics being out of Rod Brooks's lab. So we see the, the world in the same way. And, uh, but also, you know, we're between the two of us, we're pretty full stack in robotics from, you know, designing the electronics all the way up to designing kind of the machine learning uh, algorithms. So, it, and, and there's enough overlap that we can collaborate efficiently remotely uh, be on the same page, you know, do work independently and solve different parts of the problem. Um, so, you know, really to me, it, it's been a remarkable three years with Hello Robot, just on the, on this sort of collab collaborative side and, and getting to an interesting product, you know, done, you know, split across two different, two different uh, geographies. And Aaron, you mentioned that you had worked at Mecha Robots, which then uh, Google acquired in 2013. Yep. Yep. And, uh, how has the, you know, mobile manipulation, how has that evolved from the MK1 uh, mm -hmm. to stretch? Yeah, I mean, it's been a long journey. Uh, and, you know, I, I think um, some things seem very similar <laughs> and some things have changed <laughs> quite a bit, right? It, it's, it's, you know, um, you know, first off, just the availability. When we did the MK1, there, there really weren't many mobile manipulators in the world. We came out at about the same time as Willow Garage. Mecca got started at about the same time as Willow Garage. We weren't as well funded, but, um, but you know, at, at the time, it was fairly rare to have a mobile manipulator. Um, and, you know, the amount of compute you have, the sensing that you had just wasn't that great um, compared to today. And so there's been a lot of improvements there. You know, architecturally, in just terms of what a mobile manipulator is, there hasn't been really much innovation uh, at the level that I think Stretch is, because essentially what we've had uh, is these industrial arms, you know, that are, you know, arms that are designed for, for pick and place being bolted onto uh, mobile bases. And that's sort of the fundamental design approach for, for mobile manipulators. Granted, the PR2 was a really clever design out of Ken Salisbury's lab at Stanford. Really admire the design. Um, but, but generally, there hadn't been a whole lot of innovation there. 
And um, so going into Google, you know, without saying too much about the internal <laughs> twists and turns that were taken there, you know, right, one thing right. that came out of that, that uh, time there is, you know, now they have the, uh, I believe it's called the Everyday Robot Project, which is something I was helped uh, spin up when I was there. And, um, and again, you know, it, it's still, it's a, this, classic set of problems about how do we deal with the complexity of the low cost. Google has the resources to really tackle that in, in a different way. Um, and, you know, Google's strength is really on kind of machine learning, uh, the AI, they have the, the, the brain team. Um, but, you know, one thing when I was at Google, I started to realize is that while they have an incredible uh, set of engineers, uh, machine learning experts, that the problems in, in mobile manipulation aren't gonna be solved by any one company, right? It's gonna take a whole field, take the whole uh, kind of world of effort to really accomplish this. And at the same time, the, these capabilities that are being driven by advances in machine learning, they're gonna be democratized and commoditized. So, you know, it will be possible for a company like Hello Robot to leverage all of these advances and apply them in the field instead of um, walling it off behind a corporate R and D uh, uh, lab. Uh, so, you know, as as we were doing mobile manipulation in Google, I started to realize, you know, there's actually an opportunity for a small, scrappy startup to innovate in mobile manipulation and to leverage these advances that are happening on the machine learning side without having to have the resources and the size of, of a Google. You know, I have I have a picture, uh, Aaron, of the N M1 upright on my computer here, uh -huh. and I and I noticed this awesome, you know, sort of humanoid-looking torso uh, yeah. aspect to it. Right? When when is that coming to stretch? <laughs> <laughs> Awesomely well, heavy. <laughs> yeah, likely never. You know, I think that robot had twenty-five degrees of freedom, and each of them had harmonic drives, and you know. It's a very, very different creature than what Stretch is. Yeah, sure. So I, I want to ask you a question. Um, I think you guys are self-funded, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, but yes. um, not a lot of folks, you know, who are, are starting robotic startups have that luxury, right, to, to self-fund uh, their company. But just talk about why you guys decided to go that route. You know, what are the benefits to doing that? We are, we are taking a bootstrapped approach to Hello Robot. And, um, you know, it's really important for us to be able to build a credible business built on sales and not built on a, uh, making promises that we can't keep in terms of, you know, uh, venture capital based investment. Um, so with Stretch, you know, it, you know, research market, it's a modest market. Uh, it's the first step, but we realized it was really important if we're going to be in this for the long haul to build a, a viable business first and, you know, Mecca robotics, uh, I bootstrapped as well. And I kind of, you know, didn't feel as frightening as it, as it might to others. And, um, and we were in a position to self fund, although, you know, it's, we're definitely very, very scrappy and, uh, run very lean. Um, but really for, for mobile manipulation, you know, one thing we, came to realize is the market's not quite ready yet, right? You have to build the market and the technology and the natural kind of time scale that this space requires isn't a good fit for venture capital, which has a, a quicker, uh, needs a quicker return on investment and is looking for a scale in a way that's very hard to do in, a, in, in hardware of, of this type. Um, so, and we did, we did actively talk to, to a number of, of venture capital firms, uh, got really great feedback, had some interest, um, but we realized in the end, we're getting out over, over in front of our skis here because uh, what we would have to accomplish uh, with fairly limited venture funds, it just didn't seem realistic. Uh, and it's sort of like, you know, you get one shot and you have this target, you're really far out and if you miss it, and you shut your company down. And we'd seen enough, this is right around the time some of the, some very kind of high profile robotics companies were, were um, closing down because they had missed that target. Mm -hmm. And we knew we didn't, we wanted to avoid that fate and that we needed to be able to, to be around in five, 10 years when this space really takes off. We want to be a leader in that space. So uh, in, in, the, in the end, we decided let's back, 
backtrack to a, a let's build a viable business, let's sell robots, and kind of bootstrap and grow the company from there. And that's what we've we've been doing for the last couple of years. And I, I yeah, and I think you know there are definitely challenges, no doubt about that. But there are some real advantages. You know, one advantage of this comes to my mind is that you know, Aaron is a great technologist. I, and I have some uh, formidable skills as well. And together we make a really great technology team. If we were going more of a venture capital route, most of our energies or a lot of our energies could end up being devoted basically to managing investors, seeking new investors, raising money. I, I've talked with people who I believe are great technologists who end up getting sucked into that. and. They're in this high tech business, but most of, and they could have a lot to add special value, but they're spending a lot of their time really thinking about the investors. Another thing from that standpoint is, you know, for us, we have investors are not our customer. Our customers are the people who are going to buy and use our robots. And we're, we have the luxury of being able to totally focus on them and try to deliver the best value we can for them without having to also make something look good in terms of raising the next round. So, so those are some things that, you know, I, I really like about this approach. Uh, it's been great. Now, in terms of, you mentioned serving your customers, uh, obviously it's one thing to develop with a small team and you're distributed, but in terms of actually producing or manufacturing such robots, how are you guys doing that? <laughs> mm, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It, it's, it's tricky. I mean, of course, uh, scaling even from one to 10 is a huge effort and 10 to 100, even a bigger effort. So, you know, we're still at the very beginning of the journey with, with stretch. Uh, right now we are manufacturing in California. We have a, a, a production facility in Martinez. And, uh, but, you know, I, I will say we have been actively refining in uh, our production process for the last year. And so at this point, it's fairly straightforward to build it. it it's a, and it's also a relatively simple uh, robot, certainly compared to a, one of the old mecha robots that, that we did. Um, and so, you know, we are getting into a, a good position as we grow and scale to start to offload some of that to contract manufacturing. Uh, you know, but one thing I, I've learned um, in some of the past projects it's super important to not outsource production too too early because there's just so much, so many things that can go wrong and it's so hard to claw back problems when you're you want you've deployed to a contract manufacturer um, so you know while we're at this scale we want to stay as as involved in the production as we can just to sort of i think start to wrap things up here you know when it comes to the just the overall functionality of stretch you know, what do you think are, are some of the keys? I think the biggest is it just, it can reach important places in human environments. Yeah, it can reach the back of a countertop. It can reach the floor. It could actually even reaching around the human body. If I'm in bed, it could hand me something easily. If I'm sitting down, it could hand something to me easily. So, you know, if you have some application where you want to position something within a human workspace, you know, the human environment, indoors it's just it's a great design there's also from the sensing side the sensing it's able to see up high and see from the perspective that is close to what a person would see so it can see the interesting stuff in human environments the things that are on tops of these elevated surfaces and su surprisingly a lot of robots don't have either of those attributes uh, and they just open up a lot of possibilities yeah, I, th I think I would add also just the, the portability of the robot is such a game changer and it, it might seem obvious, but you know, if you think about a, a, a big desktop machine that's plugged into your wall versus a laptop, it just changes when and how you use that technology. And the same we're already seeing with stretch, right? The fact that you can just grab it and roll it out of, out of the way. Yeah. It just makes a big difference, just even just the, the kind of cognitive load of working with the robot. But also in that, if I wanted to go and do a field test, you know, down at, at a Walmart and, uh, you know, doing um, some experiments there, shelf picking, I could put it in my Prius, be there and be running that experiment in, in, in you know, 
in in an hour versus these older versions of mobile manipulators you rent a lift gate truck, you, know, you get a team, <laughs> you, you, it's, it's a whole production, right? And uh, we're seeing that internally, it just particularly because we are working from home during the pandemic, it just, it makes all the difference in the world to have that, that ease of use and portability for a mobile manipulator. And we know that a developer and a startup's work is never done. But, <laughs> um, you know, what are you looking forward to in the, in the near future for Hello Robots? Because obviously you're, you're, you know, making things available to the world, but mm. I'm sure that you're already working on, on more things. So can you give us a, a peek at what's ahead? Well, uh, for, for me, I'll just say, you know, in terms of what I'm most looking forward to, it's less about what we're going to do. And it really is more about what, what people are going to do out there with stretch. I, I am so excited to see what people do with stretch. Cause I think it's, I think we're just going to see some really cool stuff. I was part of the PR2 beta program. I saw a lot of creative, interesting things there and there weren't that many PR2s. There's a chance for there to be a lot of stretches out there with a lot of very capable people doing just cool things and feeling comfortable to explore and do do things that if you have a $400,000 robot, you don't really feel right about it doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll add, you know, we see stretch. It's, it's a, it's a concept. Um, the research edition is the first product offering, but uh, you know, we, we do anticipate and we are thinking actively about, you know, what's the next edition after the research edition? Uh, what, uh, so is it a, against a particular vertical or, or market? Um, but we expect over time that there will be different editions of stretch more targeted to different types of applications besides research. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll also say, you know, we've, we have this philosophy of iteration and that's driven us from the beginning when now we have this opportunity to iterate with customers. And I think a lot of what we end up prioritizing, I mean, we have all sorts of ideas, you know, there are all sorts of things we could imagine doing, but ultimately we want to be listening to our customers, focusing on them, finding out what, what are their needs and prioritize based on that. And we've already had some really insightful conversations with customers that uh, I think are already beginning to kind of, you know, set, set our agenda in the future. I got to ask before, before we let you go, you know, last time we talked, again, we're all working from home, Aaron, uh, one of your sons, or maybe, I don't know how many kids you guys have, but <laughs> yeah. one, of them, one of them popped into the video for a second, but how many, how many of these robots are at, do you guys have at your house? Like what are, what are any fun stories? Any, I have any, too yeah. many. I never <laughs> thought I'd say it. I never thought I'd say this, but I have too many robots in my home. <laughs> what do you tell wow. me? What do you got? I think last count, maybe it's 10 robots in my home, <laughs> different iterations. Uh, I'd have to go count to be sure. I'm actually planning to uh, soon make a shipment for the uh, Hello Robot Museum to, uh, to Martinez. <laughs> but um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm downsizing in my robot collection, but it's been, I'll say in general, it's so fun. This has kind of been a dream for me to have a robot in my own home. Uh, of course, be careful what you wish for. You don't want too many of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. What about you, Aaron? Has your uh, any interaction with with the kids? Yeah, well, you know, they almost take it for granted now. I mean, they they see the robot driving around and they just kind of walk past. I mean, they they think it's of course awesome and they 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 can remarkably well control it with a little Xbox controller. But uh, you know, at this point, it's old hat to see a robot driving down the hallway. <laughs> I, you, there, there are actually a couple of teleoperation videos that we'll be releasing at launch. Uh, games I played with my kids with the robot. One was uh, the robot holds this <laughs> this, this chicken. Uh, it's a you know some stuffed animal chicken, and it moves it up and down. And the kids were shooting it with their uh, Nerf guns, and we had a really <laughs> good time with that. Uh, we also I and my my youngest daughter, she had this idea. We brainstormed about what we could do. And she wanted me to hide Easter eggs. It wasn't near Easter at the time. She's like, hide Easter eggs with it. So I took the stretch and I hid Easter eggs and they went and hunted for them. They loved that. Oh, that's um, cool. It's, it's my daughter. <laughs> yeah. She, she's come in and she hugs the robot. She, she loves her robots. And actually I found out yesterday 
uh, she was really sad about one of the versions of the robot <laughs> leaving. So I guess she's grown attached to one of them. <laughs> well, and that brings up the idea, you know, that we are maybe not as far. We've talked a lot about how low oh, service robots, household robots are ways off. But mm. it's pretty clear that, you know, with uh, the robots that you're with Stretch, that developers now have tools in their head to start building robots in that direction. Absolutely. You know, one thing, uh, you know, Charlie has often said is we can do useful work today. We don't have to solve the, you know, AI in order to make robots useful today. Uh, and, and primarily through, uh, uh, teleoperation mixed autonomy. I think there's a lot of things that we will start to see stretch robots like stretch doing and, and adding, adding value, helping people. And I think it's exciting to see that kind of, as, as turning that corner. Well, we're, we're excited for you guys. I know this is uh clearly it's a, it's a passion for both of you as you've been working on this for, for what, three years now. So mm -hmm. Aaron Edzinger, Charlie Kemp, co-founders of Hello Robot. Congrats on uh, the launch of Stretch and, and coming out of stealth mode. And uh, we'll talk to you guys again soon. Good luck. Oh, Great. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Loved it. It was really interesting. Fun. So Gene, mobile manipulation in the home. Do you uh, see that happening anytime soon? You know, as much as I would like to, again, for the reasons I mentioned earlier with assisting uh, various folks with certain fairly basic needs, uh, there's a lot of challenges. You know, manipulation itself, you have to handle a wide range of objects in a fairly unstructured environment. Uh, the price has to come way down. I mean, you know, you've got to get from tens of thousands of dollars to a uh, price point of maybe just thousands of dollars. And, you know, autonomy is much harder than, than a lot of people may realize. And the type of autonomy we're talking here is approaching that uh, universal or general uh, purpose robot. And so there's a lot of work that has to be done there, but um, these guys are doing a great job in, in helping that advance. Yeah, so that's really the, that was really my takeaway is they're trying to democratize the advancement of mobile manipulation, right? So I thought Charlie had a great line in there where he said, you know, when, when it comes to robotics researchers, whether it's academia or corporate labs, it's, you know, you, you have maybe one mobile manipulator for the entire class, right, or the entire right. lab. And, you know, what they're trying to do is change that to get one robot per researcher, which will, will certainly help move things forward. But yeah, I think, I think the price, you know, that, that's still kind of really the key is the price has to come way, way down. And maybe for someone who's physically unable to, you know care for their home you know maybe it'll be uh useful more useful for them but just the time the trade-off in the time where you know if i was to clean or pick up some of the things in my house versus the amount of time that a mobile manipulator would would take to do that same task i'm not really sure that that makes much sense at this point but we'll we'll see what happens uh, we're going to switch gears now and, and talk about Miso Robotics, which just yesterday announced a pilot with White Castle, which I think, what are they, one of the first, or if not the first fast food restaurant? 99 um, years, yeah. Yep. Yep. So, you know, White Castle, they're now testing the flippy robot on a rail system. Gene, what did Buck say? Why, why is White Castle now turning to automation? Well, you know, fast food has had a, a number of challenges uh, up until the pandemic, uh, there weren't problems with turnover. You know, this is an entry-level job. Uh, typically, fast food restaurants don't pay that well. And so you've got to have uh, a lot of throughput. You have to be very productive, very efficient, but you also have to accept that you are not going to have a super skilled or super experienced staff. And, and uh, with low unemployment up until March, uh, you just couldn't even find uh, the staff. Now, there's the issue of food safety. And there's the issue of social distancing for uh, maintaining uh, protection for both the staff and for customers. And then finally, there's just keeping up again with the demand for uh, customized food that in many cases is now being delivered or picked up and not eaten inside a restaurant. So automation is viewed by all the major fast food chains as a step that they need to do to improve efficiency and quality and uh, at the end of the day, the customer experience. Here's Gene's conversation with Buck Jordan, the co-founder and CEO of Miso Robotics. They discussed the pilot with White Castle. 
MISO's future plans to build its own food grade robotic arms, a potential robotics as a service business model, and much more. Enjoy. We're excited to be among the first to share your news with, with the world, not just of robotics, but anyone who enjoys a hamburger. Uh, I think this is uh, pretty big news. Yeah, uh, you know, now you can have your uh, fried products and your burgers cooked to perfection just the way you like them, um, you know, affording a lot of mass customization, which is what robots, of course, are, are really good at. For our audience who may not have read all my articles or may not be familiar, can you briefly descri- describe Flippy Robot on a Rail and how it might be different from other cooking robots that people might have seen online? Sure. I mean, first, a brief overview. Um, you know, the, the fast food industry is facing some real fundamental challenges, um, labor challenges due to social distancing in kitchens, a massive increase of demand for delivery, and shifting consumer preference for lower touch establishments. So these are all challenges which, which can be solved through automation. It's not easy, but it can definitely be solved today. Um, so Misa Robotics, the maker of Flippy, is a robotic kitchen assistant built to automate the back of house of quick serve restaurants, specifically grilling and frying today. Other applications in the future. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've seen, uh, we, we've already proven the value proposition for robotics in kitchens, but since the pandemic, the value has really just increased exponentially, as has the, in, the uh, inbound demand from large name brand quick serve restaurants. And so, um, you know, I mean, as, as you can imagine, robots offer safer cooking, cooking environment. They keep speed of production where it needs to be while also allowing kitchens to continue to adhere to social distancing requirements and really reassuring customers that the foods had minimal human contact. Um, not to mention, of course, when you cook things perfectly, you reduce food waste to a uh, pretty manageable, almost zero, zero level. And you increase the things that are really important to quick serve restaurant, which is higher quality, higher consistency and faster speed of service. Um, so, um, you know, what we've done with our, uh, with our overhead, overhead rail system is we've really enabled our, our, our machine to get out of the aisle way because you can't be in the aisle way if you're in a, in a quick serve restaurant kitchen, because those are highly engineered spaces. So it's an upside down robotic rail um, where, where Flippy can, you know, dip the fries, move over, flip a burger, and then maybe during downtimes, it can go and do prep work. So really we're, we're, we're working to, um, uh, you know, bring uh, automation to the masses for the first time ever. And, you know, what, what really differentiates us from other competitors is that most other people are taking mechanical approaches, whereas we're taking a flexible robotic arm approach. Our, our machine, can do anything a human arm can move can do, whereas uh, other competitors will be just be making a fry maker. Right, and I just saw the, the video of Flippy Robot in the Rail, and the, you know the robot arm, like you said, is hanging down. It can take a basket of fries, put it in the oil, move it uh, from furniers and so on. And I, I think the interesting thing to know here is also that the robot, sure, it's replacing certain tasks, but people are still around, right? They're still moving through that aisleway that you talked about that's highly engineered. And um, there's still, even though you're minimizing human contact with food, there is still a role for people in these restaurants. For sure. I mean, this is actually not about replacing labor, which is, of course, the thing that people go to when they first um, think robots in the kitchen. You know, this is really about, um, you know, moving labor to where it needs to be, which is front of house, you know, creating more, more better customer experiences for their, for the consumers. Um, And really trying to, trying to grapple with these, these new challenges that the industry is dealing with. Um, you know, just the idea that you have to social distance in kitchens, and none of these kitchens have been designed for that. These kitchens are tight spaces because they're trying to optimize for real estate cost. And now all of a sudden, nobody can work next to each other. I mean, you know, that's really tough to adapt to. So the only way to do that is really uh, robotics. And Buck, you mentioned mass customization. Now, obviously, uh, with when people go to a fast food uh, store and they inspect a certain level of order customization, but how does uh, Flippy help enable that? So, you know, Fli- Flippy can, um, can uh, you know, I mean, I mean, so you, th- these quick serve restaurant menus are, are designed specifically to be implemented by, um, you know, en- entry level workers. It's not Gordon Ramsay back there making a big <laughs> Mac. Right. Um, you know, and, 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 it's, and it's not that, that corporate chefs at major, um, at major quick serve restaurants don't have, um, uh, incredible talent. These guys make amazing food, um, but they also have to make amazing food that can also be prepared in a very quick, easy way by entry-level workers. And so, so one of the one of the really interesting quotes that the Levy Group uh, corporate chef gave us. So Levy Group operates Dodger Stadium, where we operate too. Um, they were just so enthusiastic because they're like, well, now now I don't need to like simplify my menu all the time. Now I can really start to elevate things 
in a way that I couldn't before because there were issues with implementation and execution. And let's talk about Mesa Robotics and White Castle in particular. So when did, I know you've been approached by numerous chains, but when did your two companies first really start talking about this? So we've been speaking for over a year. Um, you know, whether at, whether you know it or not, uh, you know, White Castle generally uh, tends to be the first first people to do things in, in the industry. They're a really forward thinking brand. Um, and also, I'm like I'm a rabid uh, White Castle slider fan, so <laughs> I was biased. But but um, uh, you know, we we started a year ago, um, and then we um, we really started getting serious pre COVID, and then once COVID had happened, everything kind of accelerated because you know the and and, and that's not. Um, uh, unusual for what, what we're seeing in the market. Really in February, everyone clammed up, you know, everyone's like, what's going on? Let me retrench and just understand the situation. But in March, April, um, you know, our phones started ringing off the hook with, um, you know, people looking for automation solutions. And right now there's not really anywhere to go um, to, if you're looking to automate in your existing brand. Um, and so it's been a really wild ride for us. I can imagine. And, you know, White Castle's been around for almost 100 years, and it's interesting that they're still very forward-looking. Um, and so in terms of working with them, are you having to do any kind of uh, modifications to uh, Flippy Roar uh, in order to put it inside a, a White Castle? You know, is there any form factor or speed or, or size things that you had to tweak to get it in there? Yeah, I mean, you know, one one small thing. I mean, first thing you, you need to know about these these uh, quick serve restaurant kitchens is that every kitchen is its own unique snowflake. Um, so we've been we've been pretty mindful to design our system in a way that can fit into almost everything. Uh, White Castle uses back sh back shelf mounted hoods as opposed to like overhead canopy hoods. So we had to we had to modify our system a little bit for that. But other than that, um, that's it. And I know that one of the things that you're going to be working on with White Castle is this integration because there are obviously point of sale systems, um, you know, flow or, or uh, product tracking systems. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how much is involved on the data side? Yeah, well, well, the data is where it gets really, really interesting. You know, so so one of our customers, um, you know, gave us a great quote. They said, "Our data stops at the walk-in freezer." And we pick it up again at the POS, and we don't really know what happens in between. And so now, um, now, now there there's a potential for perfect data in the back of house. And what do you do with that? It could be pretty interesting. You know, so so we not only have a robotic solution, we also have a software computer vision only solution, um, where we can essentially know exactly what's going on in the in the workspace. We can know the burger line is backed up ten minutes. And so, guess what, Flippy? Do not drop the fries. Because right. you drop the fries, because that's what happens today. If, if you come and order a, a Crave case at White Castle and, and fries, um, you know they're they're probably just going to drop the fries. It's going to cook for three minutes, and then it's going to sit there under a heat lamp for seven minutes while while <laughs> we wait for the burgers. You know, uh, and same thing for delivery and all that stuff because it's coordination around the kitchen. But Miso knows that that the optimal uh, thing to do is to wait until minute seven and then drop the fries. So they both come off hot and ready um, for the customer which is acute when you're dealing with delivery. Right, and you're dealing with, you know, not just one order, but obviously dozens of orders simultaneously or, or nearly simultaneously. So that's a, the efficiencies that could be gained out of that. And frankly, the improved, nobody likes soggy french fries, right? So the improved quality is also a potential advantage there. Huge, and, and I mean like, and, and now it's like, it's like that quality and that freshness is so important because you know, because so much is going through the drive-through and going through delivery now, and and the person's going to drive 15 minutes before they finally get it home to eat it, or the delivery person delivers to them. And so, you know, every every second is is diminishing quality of product, and so it's really important. Everything is timed just just so. So for the tests, will uh, White Castle personnel be operating Flippy, or is Miso going to be? Uh, doing things remotely, or you, you have technicians that are available. How how do you divide that up? No, nope, um, it's totally touchless. Uh, you know, I mean, Misa people are, are available for twenty four seven support, technical support if the thing breaks down or there's an issue, it doesn't break down is the is the punchline. But um, but uh, you know, I mean, basically, like th these, this has to be designed to be used by entry level workers. You know, so real simple. You don't, you can't be a computer engineer to run this thing. And so, so essentially, um, uh, it's integrated with POS. They'll start cooking the correct amount of product by count or by weight, whatever whatever the order may be, and that dumps it out into a dump station. 
you know, perfectly timed, you know, for the, for the teammate to use it. And so it's really safe. It's a cobotic experience. There's also some barriers and safety sensors that keep everyone uh, separated. Um, you know, but, uh, but, but it's highly reliable. It's an industrial robotic arm. It just doesn't quit. How many white castle sites will be initially using Fluffy? So you're going to see it rolling out um, in September, October uh, to, uh, to a location in the Chicago land area. Uh, and then after that, there will be more announcements, um, but uh, we're saving that for later. Well, I look forward to sharing those. In terms of, uh, obviously, will customers be told or will they be able to see that a robot was involved in the preparation of their food? Yep. Uh, you know, so, so White Castle kitchens are very open and, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, it'll be very apparent that there's a robot there. And so, so yeah, it, it should be obvious. And, and, you know, per, personally, I, I tend to think that consumers are going to prefer um, a low touch environment, you know, so I, I think that's going to become increasingly important in the future. Well, and, and you mentioned safety, you know, before the current pandemic, there was a lot of concern about traceability and about food safety. But now it's as much about the safety of the personnel, both behind the counter and in front of the counter, um, you know, protecting them through social distancing, through minimal contact. Um, in terms of what do you expect going forward to be the emphasis, or is it that just in bringing in automation helps solve both of those issues? It, it, it solves both those issues. I mean, I mean, I mean, it makes for like a, a, a more touchless food product for the consumer. It makes for a safer work environment for the, for the team members behind the counter because they don't need to be crammed in, you know, they can now be separated by automation. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but aside from that, just like just the watchwords of any quick serve restaurant industry is, you know, higher quality, higher consistency and faster speed of service. And we knock all those out of the park. And I know the last time we talked, Miso had just entered a partnership with Pathspot regarding hand scanning technology, yep. again, for hygiene purposes. Will the Fluffy at White Castle also incorporate that technology, or is that a separate? That's, that's a separate thing. We're, we're going to integrate that in later stages of the pilot, um, but just starting out, we're just, we're just operating the fryer. But Pathspot is, is really critical, I think, because you know, our Flippy is, is incredibly hygienic by himself. He's not going to catch a cold. And he's not going to infect anybody, but uh, but the workers who interact with them could. And so it's important for us to have um, uh, workers who interact with them just be hygienic. And, and that's, that's why path spot is really important. And I assume you must have some sort of cleaning regimen for Fluffy itself and the various components. Uh, we do. The, and, 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 and therein lies something that, that might be interesting to, the, to your, 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 your listeners. Um, you know, so, so we have to make food safe robotics which is, which has never really been done. You know, so like you, you, you might go to any one of the robotic arm manufacturers and, and, and they'll sell you a, a, a quote unquote food safe robot, but it's not built for quick serve restaurant food safe. It's built for like industrial, let's say chicken farm food safe, right? H okay. Hose it down with a pressure hose. So that does not work. So no arm on the planet today um, is a food safe arm. And so that's why Miso is, is adept at, at uh, uh, modifying industrial robotic arms for, um, a quick serve rest restaurant industry. And in fact, we're going to be building our own at some point. Oh, okay. And how long do you expect the trial of White Castle to take? Uh, or, you know, is there, obviously you can be rolling it out to eventually multiple <clears throat> sites, but um, at least for this initial one in Chicago, in Chicago land, how long will that be going? So I can only speak in just general generalities, you know, so, so typically um, our, our customers will, will opt for a three to four month, uh, pilot program, but, but oftentimes they, they get one and a half months in they're like, okay, well, let's go. Because because you know you really learn everything you need to know in the first month of operation, and it's pretty uh, you know it, it's it's a real no brainer the way it's set up, and 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 especially the pricing of it too. The pricing is highly attractive. And and you mentioned that you know obviously a lot of people who work in fast food chains, it's either entry level or they're semi retired, or you know these are people who don't have a lot of, of technical skills necessarily. How much training is needed for them to be able to work uh, alongside or with Flippy? I mean, like very, very little, you know, it, it's, it, it doesn't, you don't have to, there's no buttons to push. There's no, um, you know, there, there there's occasionally a, a cleaning regimen you have to do like once a week or so, but that's, that's really not, not difficult at all. Just a wipe down. Um, in fact, Flippy cleans itself, Flippy cleans its own uh, work, work area, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. So no training. Excellent. And, and in terms of feedback, I know you've already had trials at like Dodger Stadium and other locations. Um, are you expecting a different type of feedback now that it's at a bigger chain or are you expecting more a matter of refining what you've already done? 
Well, this has all been a, been a, been a matter of refining things, you know, so, so Dodger stadium, it, it wasn't a pilot, you know, we're actually still installed if, if uh, there were, there were ever going to be any baseball games again. Um, you know, so, so Dodger stadium, um, you know, we learned a lot. So first of all, imagine the worst rush of all time. It's zero people, then six POS is 20 deep, right? Everyone wants their chicken and tater tots at the same time. Right. And so, so a, a great example is, is uh, they, the Levy group who runs the chicken and tot stand at Dodger stadium, they were going to shut that, shut that stand down and, and put a pizza location in because they're having such quality issues and, you know, quality issues because um, you know, this rush comes, everyone knows it's coming. And so they start burst cooking chicken, just massive amounts of chicken and they end up burning it because uh-huh. they're also afraid of salmonella. And the problem with frying is that when you burn something, it leaches into the oil. And then by the fourth inning, everything tastes like it's burnt. Um, and, and also that the, the chicken was dry and tastes and, you know, it was dry, but like once we, we put uh, flippy in, every piece of chicken gets temperature tested at, at the core. And it also, and that feeds back into the AI, which makes it cook it more and more perfectly. And so it didn't take more than two games to be able, be able to cook the most succulent chicken you've ever tasted in your life. Um, so they, they love it. Um, the learnings are that, you know, we were in, a, in, in the aisle way, which ended up being okay for them. Um, the product also costs like $65,000 in terms of bomb cost bill of material, which is the sum of all the parts and pieces. Um, and so those are two major, major issues that we, um, we decided to change when we came to White Castle. So White Castle is overhead rail system, gets it out of the aisle way. And it also costs about $30,000 today in terms of bomb cost. Um, but, uh, you know, by mid next year, maybe even sooner, we're going to, we're going to chisel that bomb cost down to $20,000. I'm really shooting for 15, but 20 is very achievable. And then once we, once we get there, um, it's going to be, it's going to become possible for us to give this product away for free, or at least with, with, with no upfront, uh, upfront costs and discharge uh, a monthly robots as a service fee or RAS. Robots as a service is a model. Certainly we've talked about, but I'm interested how are you going to get the price down? I mean, that's a pretty significant cut from you know, significant. 30 to 20 to below that. How, how are you expecting to do that? Is that a matter of scale? Is it a matter of, uh, you know, minimizing components or, or how are you going to accomplish that? Yeah, well, scale always, always helps. And by the way, every number I've given you is at volume of 100. You know, so it does okay. change a little bit uh, in lower volumes. But, um, but uh, you know, the arm that we're using is, is an uh, incredible arm. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a FANUC. It's, it's built for eight years, lights out operation, 100,000 hours uptime without failure. You know, because it's it's used to working on like a car line where like one minute of that of stopping that SUV line is worth a hundred grand. I'm just making these numbers up, right? Um, so it's wildly robust. Um, if you were to apply that kind of that kind of specking out to to what we're what, what we're doing, which is the the lunch and dinner rush, and late night rush for for White Castle, um, you know, this thing will last like thirty years. You know, so it is over specced and too expensive, and so. So we're we're actively looking to um, either partner with somebody to develop an arm or build one ourselves. Um, you know, so 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 that is going to be um, is going to happen by mid next year. We're going to be substituting a, a different arm in that's that's a lot cheaper, and after that, we're probably going to build our own. Um, so it's it's and then, and of course a lot and everything else is chiseling, just you know little pieces here and there. I know we recently covered a couple of uh, pizza making robots. It's funny that you mentioned pizza at the stadium. Yeah. Uh, you know, food robotics at the end of last year, we were already predicting that it was going to be a hot area this year. And obviously uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has sort of changed a lot of expectations. Um, what are you envisioning for this market going forward? Because the latter half of the year, even as we are trying to reopen things and uh, emerge from the crisis, however haltingly in the U.S., there is still an expectation of quick delivery food, of um, you know hygienic uh, order fulfillment. And do you anticipate that this, you know, a lot of other people are going to jump in, or are you just right now focusing on, hey, we've got White Castle, <laughs> and and let's get out there. Well, I mean, first of all, we're like, we've got White Castle, do not screw it up. Um, you know, we, we, we are laser focused on the, on this, uh, this pilot, you know, we have, we have some of the best, well, we have the best food automation engineers on the planet, uh, focused on this and they're all eating sliders right now. Um, <laughs> and so, so, you know, but, but in terms of, you know, what I, what I see in the market, you know, so I'm sure that we will have competition because this market is too big and the need is just too great. And, you know, the, the best investments always come from the hardest, really hard problems. And so, there's nothing harder than, than automating in a, in a restaurant. You know, it, it, it's really easy to automate in a Tesla factory where 
you can afford to put a, to buy a $2 million arm to have it put on a Tesla car door because you're adding a lot of value. But it's another thing to um, use that same arm to flip a burger, right? So that's not going to work. So, so I think that, um, you know, today, th this has never been possible before and until today. You know, the, the price of robotic arms is dropping to the floor. Similarly, the price of computer vision and compute is getting really cheap. You know, you can buy an Intel RealSense camera for 200 bucks and tell, and tell an Apple from Norris from a pair in volumetric data so you can grab it. So all of a sudden, in the past couple of years, automation and robotics has, has gone from being a very CapEx heavy game to being more of a software problem. And that's what gets exciting about it. So there's going to be tons of competition coming in. Um, but the problem is, I think that, you know, we've spent uh, four years building up this incredible amount of IP. And I think that, um, that it's, it's going to take a couple of years for, for someone with an unlimited budget, like let's say Amazon or Panasonic to catch up with us. Um, but how I view um, the future of the food industry, which might've been what you're asking. Sorry, I, for, I, oh, I veered off. Um, you know, so I, I think from now until the next uh, five or seven years, you're going to see companies like Miso, Miso being the only one today at least, but companies like Miso, um, you know, coming in and automating parts of the kitchen. You know, we automate the fryer and the griddle and one day assembly and other things and prep, right? Um, companies like that, you know, automating parts of it. But, you know, and I think in, in years one to two from now, or 12, 24 months, you're going to see start seeing an explosion of, you know, high quality delivery, uh, sorry, high quality kiosks. Um, I, I don't use the word vending machine because vending machines are really the, the precursor to this. And that's, that's, when you think vending machine, you think pre-processed, pre-packaged, pre-cooked possibly food that you're just heating up in a microwave in your vending machine. Uh, but this is different because of low cost automation. We're able to, in, in the case of Pistro, you're, we're able to go from, you know, flour and water to fresh, fully customized pizza in less than four minutes. And that is mind blowing. And so I think you're going to see an, an explosion of big brands and also new brands entering this, this uh, kiosk market. And I think in year five to seven, uh, at that point, you're going to start seeing all new builds be completely blown up and reimagined. I think you're going to see, um, you know, 100% automation and only front of house staff. I think you're going to see, um, you know, restaurants, uh, restaurant kitchens be like 25% the size and probably fitting in shipping containers to facilitate delivery and get, and get product closer to consumers. Well, I, I do look forward to the day when my burrito or falafel is uh, <laughs> prepared by a robot and brought to me while it's still hot and fresh. That would be, that would be yeah. Also by a robot. <laughs> and by a robot, absolutely. Yeah. Now, one of the other things that, uh, that you mentioned is obviously White Castle is a, a big name. Um, they're nationwide. But at the same time, you're not just, it's not exclusive, right? You are also in talks with other fast food chains. Yeah, I mean, I mean, frankly, you know, we we don't believe that um, that automation is really a choice anymore. You know, if if you're seriously thinking about the future, you must automate. And so, right now, um, there's not many places to, to talk to. Like, like if you're any any one of the chains you could name or think about, they have definitely called us. And it's because um, we're the only people today who who can do this. And so, so we're we're looking at um, uh, some exciting stuff coming up. But you know, right now, we're really just focused on nailing White Castle. One of the things I want to ask, and obviously you can't name names, is uh, is there sort of a universal understanding, like all these different chains, no matter what they make or, or what their brand identity might be, they're all interested in getting automation, but they all understand the equal layer and they all value the equal layer. Is that something that you think was going to happen very soon? Oh, it, it's, it, it, yeah, it's, it's universal. Like, you know, they, they all realize that automation is you know, they need to have a plan for automation. You know, some of them are, are even trying to automate themselves, which is really a disaster, I think. Um, I mean, it, it is, it's just like, but that, that's, that's just a, that's a, an indication of how, how, how underserved this market is. And so, um, you know, they all, they all think that, um, you know, low touch establishments are going to be really, you know, key in consumers' minds, at least for the next uh, four years. That's a direct quote from somebody. Um, and then they're all trying to figure out how to service delivery better. Um, and they're all trying to figure out, um, you know, how to incre how to deal with like the what pre-COVID was a massive labor gap. You know, there's a million people missing from the quick serve restaurant workforce in the United States. And fast forward ten years, it, the gap was supposed to be four million people. I don't know how COVID affects all that right now, but but um, they they say this is the only way forward. So you, you're definitely going to see a lot of this coming out. And have you seen, you know, obviously we, we see robot waiters in Japan or. Uh, things like that in other parts of the world. Are you getting interest from overseas as well? Yeah, we we we've got a ton of interest from overseas. You know, we, we do need to stay focused and and just nail the U.S. market. Um, but uh, we're we're definitely you know one of the big changes asking us for overseas uh, 
uh, stuff and, you know, we might have to do it, right? Well, I look forward to the day when I can travel and I don't have to worry about the airport restaurant being closed or the rest area being closed and I can just get my food uh, no matter where I am or when I am in time locally. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I definitely uh, look forward to continuing to follow and share your progress. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you for having me. Love, love your podcast. Well, well thank you for that. Uh, we're only, uh, you know, a month and a half in, but we're definitely uh, excited um, to be able to help share really interesting news like this, because as I said, we've been talking about food robotics for a little while, and we've been talking with you for a little while, but they'll share it directly. is really exciting. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm biased, of course. All I think about is robots all day. So, <laughs> Well, all I think about is food, so we're in the right place. <laughs> Amazing. Let's get together. We get, let's start an empire. I, I can't wait. I can't wait. Well, uh, we'll definitely, uh, again, thank you so much for your time, uh, Buck Jordan, uh, and good luck with Mesa Robotics uh, trials with uh, White Castle. All right. Well, thank you very much. See ya. So, again, thank you to the guys at Hello Robot and Misa Robotics. Uh, we, you know, it's always great to learn about both mobile manipulation and uh, as a foodie, you know, the idea of bringing automation into uh, kitchens on a scale that we haven't seen before. And so I, I'm excited about all of that. So that's going to do it for episode seven of the Robot Report podcast. Uh, thanks again to Aaron Ensinger, Charlie Kemp, and Buck Jordan. And thank you to everyone who listened. By the way, if you're interested in speaking with us, uh, do let us know through social media or through our contacts. Uh, we're always looking for real robotics innovators to talk to. New episodes of the Robot Report podcast drop each and every Wednesday. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. Smash that subscribe button and, and please leave us a rating. For Eugene Dimitri, I'm Steve Crow. Have a great week, everyone. We'll talk to you again next Wednesday.